chance, perhaps one touch and across. Does get the ball in, beats everybody. Ballman at the far post to collect, possibly knock it back into Mo Harkin. Harkin looking for one into the feet, gets it back, nice touch. Chance for Mo Harkin, opening goal. Lovely work between Harkin and Jermaine McSporran. Carlisle joined in the penalty area by shaven head Carl Reddy, which is probably done out of choice, and the bald head of Ian Dowie, which probably isn't. Dowie is rising, beaten to it by Ballman. Wardley heads it back in, and a chance for Reddy, and then uh, eventually it's in by Ian Dowie. And Rangers back on level terms within three minutes. There's a chance for a nice layoff to the feet of Peacock, and gets away from McSporran, gets his cross in, Bates just about reaches it. And Wardley with the overhead kick, and a good goal as well, Stuart Wardley. Chance for Harkin to run again at the uh, defence. Jones is in again, Reddy's with the uh, touch, and it's going to be an own goal, right on half-time. QPR defenders are uh, questioning the linesman's decision to let the ball go. They felt perhaps that Jones was offside, but he timed his run well to get in front of Carl Reddy. And as he looked to get his shot on goal, Reddy slid in, trying to make the challenge, only succeeded in poking it past his own keeper. And we come back on level terms just at the half-time break. But well, Keith, what a disappointment it's been for you in a way, really. A testimonial season which has started so well, but then you're out with this injury. Yeah, um, it's a funny old injury to be honest because uh, I managed to do the two weeks of pre-season, the running, um, which was fine. Um, got away with that, but as soon as the balls came out, I had a problem with my calf muscles, so uh, very disappointed, I must admit. You've been pleased with the evening, the, the testimony, or were you pleased with the way everything went? Yeah, it was fine. I, the thing was, I, I was just hoping that there was no hitches, no problems, and on the night it went fine. Uh, lovely turnout from our fans, well pleased with that. Um, I thought Leicester might bring a few more supporters, um, purely because of the fact that they'd uh, been playing a few games abroad, and they'd signed a few players and they hadn't played in this country. But uh, as it turned out, they, I think they brought 250 people, which wasn't too bad. Uh, but I can't fault Leicester City themselves. They were fantastic. They brought um, a, a great squad of players down and I think it proved to be a quite an entertaining game. For the last pre-season friendly, Alan Smith returned to Adams Park as a new manager of Crystal Palace. He must have thought that Steve Brown had returned to haunt him and also hoped Wickham Wanderers would be found a bit fluffy. Not a bit of it. As the opening goal arrived and Wickham were on their way, it got even worse for Alan Smith when a shot from Mo Harkin took a deflection and it went straight into the path of Andy Baird, who gratefully made it 2-0. Wickham dominated the game and at full value for what was going to be a very good 3-1 victory. Jermaine McSporran hits the post and it's Danny Sender who turns the ball into the net and Wickham are three up. However, not to worry, there was some consolation. Unfortunately, this time, Steve Brown giving it to Crystal Palace when he got on the end of this long ball from the left and headed past Martin Taylor. 3-1, it finished. Well, here we are on Monday morning after the game against Saturday of Crystal Palace. We've just had a look at your board. Would you say this would be one of the worst starts you've had to a season in terms of injuries, even though some of them are niggles? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we, we were left over with three from the end of last season, which before you even start, you've got three on the board. And they're all quite um, quite nasty problems. Um, David Carroll's got a pelvic condition and uh, Sean Devine's knee. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, the rest of them are all sort of little niggles. Uh, Alan Beaton, uh, you know, we can't do anything about that. He came here after being involved in an RTA. And so we've just got to look after him. The rest of them are really sort of like aches and pains and strains from the, the very, very gruelling pre-season schedule that's been set for the players. Yeah, I mean, that's always one of the problems any football club has to deal with, that uh, if they don't work the players too hard, then they won't be ready for the start. If they work them a bit too hard, this is the risk that could occur. Well, that's right. I mean, it's, it's a very, very fine line, as you've said. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, you can live by the sword and you die by the sword in that respect. If you push people very, very hard, ultimately somebody will get injured but you know I think at the end of the day it's a far better way to be than um, sort of having them all sitting around wrapped up in cotton wool doing nothing because once the first ball of the season starts they're nowhere near it.
we've accumulated a few injuries over the course of the time. Hopefully, um, there's only three that are really that are causing us problems, which is uh, Divine Karen and Emblem. Um, but the rest, I'm hoping that the three or four people we took off on Saturday will be available for the weekend. I said this year the squad is slightly smaller than it was last year, but there's more quality throughout. Every player in that squad is capable of playing the first team. And that was shown on Saturday against Crystal Palace when uh, Martin Lee came in and had his first full game for the, for the team um, and did very well. So um, that, that's good, that's encouraging. And um, we're hoping this year that a few more players break through in the way Danny Bullman and, and Mark Rogers did last season. We've scored quite a lot of goals pre-season, which is encouraging. So, and they've been shared around by the team. Um, Jermaine mcsporran has been on fire pre-season. So, and Bairdy's nicked a couple of poachers' goals, which he wasn't doing last year. So the signs are that you know one person's misfortune is another person's opportunity, and they've got to take that chance given to them. Um, and, and the good thing is, with regards to those injuries, that when they do come back, it'll be like signing new players. Hopefully by then we'll have set a firm foundation in the league. Stoke finished last season strongly thanks to heavy investment from their Icelandic backers. But they lost keeper Gavin Ward injured early on against Wickham and that upset their rhythm. Replacement Carl Muggleton kept out Jermaine McSporran and no one could get to the rebound. Wickham were well organised and abrasive. An excellent point for them against one of the promotion favourites. Kyle Lightbourne came closest to spoiling their day but Stoke had to content themselves with a draw. Pre-season has been encouraging, the results have been encouraging, the performances have been encouraging, but that all means nothing if we don't start well. We've got a tough start with Stoke away, um, and then our second away game is Millwall, and I've, I fancy those two to be top of the table come the end of the season. And sandwiched between them, of course, we've got this Northampton game, who, but for the fact they signed two forwards, you said would, would, have, would have been a home win, but now they've gone out and bought two quality forwards for this division. Um, it's very much more you know, a game where it could go either way, but we'd have to be on our metal for it. Um, and I'm sure the lads, you know, coming home will want to show the want to show all the fans what they can do. Bullman gets it down to the feet of McSprawl and a lovely turn away from Spedding again. And McSprawl off on a run, cuts across Spedding, keeps going towards the penalty area. He's now going outside Hope, and Hope stands up well to block the cross. Harkey uh, comes back to retrieve things and then played forward a chance for Jones breaking into the box, and he's hauled down by Hendon. And I think the referee is uh, maybe going to have a word with Hendon on this one. Is he pointed to the spot? I think he has. Looking to see what colour card he's going to give Hendon. Jones certainly uh, causing problems. Looking trying to decide who's going to take the kick. I think it may well be Steve Brown. And it's only a yellow card. It's a penalty in the opening five minutes of this second half. And Steve Brown against his old club. Northampton fans have come out from their seats to stand behind the goal to try and put him off. It's Steve Brown against Keith Welch. And Brown with the opening goal of the game. Calmly tucks the ball away to the left-hand side, or the right-hand side rather, of Keith Welch. He was diving away to his left. And Wickham with an excellent start to the second half. Millwall made a promising start at home to Wickham. Neil Harris got his second of the campaign from the free kick, but the Lions went on to lose their 100% record, along with two of their players. David Livermore and Stephen Reid were both late sendings off, by which time Wanderers had claimed their first away win. Andy Baird levelled the scores early in the second half and almost got the winner. Instead, Baird hit the post and Danny Bullman finished off the second, so 2-1, and 11 against 9 at the end. Rogers just asking for someone to come in support. Eventually it's Baird in the penalty area. Tries to get in the cross. Boyce just holds it up. McLaren's headed to the edge of the area where Simpson gets the ball on the floor. Back for Rogers, perhaps on his left foot again to curl one in, looking for Jones. Brown gets up. Jones headed in. Baird just tangles in the box. It's going to be a penalty. Baird's put the ball in the net, appeals to the referee, but referee Fraser Stratton had already blown for a, a penalty. Baird did well to take the knockdown from Steve Jones. Controlled the ball, and as he fell to the floor under a strong challenge, referee Fraser Stratton blew for the penalty. So with 16 minutes gone, Steve Brown is going to have a chance to add to his penalty in the last home game against Northampton. Now from... 12 yards out, Steve Brown, after a slight delay, steps up, 
And off the post, can he get the clearance in? He's going to the second attempt, Steve Brown. Just when he thought the chance had gone begging, he'd beaten the outstretched hand of Mark Ovendale. The ball rebounded off the post. Brown, the first player, onto the end of it. Steve Brown gives Wickham the lead after 16 minutes. About 10 minutes to go in this match, and I'm still desperately clinging to Steve Brown's 16th minute opener. So still having to defend, and uh, I'm just uh, coming off the line there, and Candol has made an immediate impact. Brentford haven't won at home since January, and with luck like this, it's not surprising. Andy Scott somehow finding the woodwork from a yard after only six minutes. Wickham are yet to lose in the league, and it's a measure of the club's progress they were disappointed with an away draw. They were guilty of squandering the perfect opportunity to take three points. Danny Sender sent flying in the area by Simon Marsh. Steve Brown took the penalty, but the keeper read it well. Nil-nil. Rodgers and Bates both forward for the first corner of the match. Which will be taken by Steve Brown. McCarthy was in there underneath it and it's been hooked in by Ben. Laurie Sanchez said before the game that the striker needed a goal to get him off the mark this season and Andy Baird has got it. Bullman, led off by Rammel, and the slotted ball back has put McSporran in here, and he has finished it. The former Oxford City man, the former Oxford United fan, scores against the men from the manor ground, and surely now Wickham will be heading for their highest ever place in the Football League tonight. Cook was waiting. Hit by Tate! Well, at the very least, it's a consolation, and with five minutes to go, there may be an Oxford revival in the script yet. Be careful they don't do anything in haste, and Bullman putting the pressure on. Well, the assistant on the near side is flagging. He's given a penalty. For me, he's given a penalty in, in this position. John Richardson, I think he feels Richardson pulled. Look at the players, they don't know what's going on either. They're all wondering. The There's a discussion between them. A lot of speculation as well. Oh, yes. but he has. He has given a penalty kick. Oh, Richardson just gets behind Bullman there. There's the tug of the shirt. That's what the assistant saw. Now, Wickham have missed their last two penalties. Steve Brown who scored from one against his old club, Northampton, has missed two since, although he did score from a rebound from one of them. And it looks like he's going to hand over the penalty-taking duties to Chris Vinnigan, who I gather won um, a club penalty competition the day after Brown's last miss. But it's rather different taking them in a match situation than taking them on the training field. So can Vinnigan reproduce that here? What a moment for all concerned. Vinicom could win this game for Wickham. And for Laurie Sanchez's team, he's facing the rookie goalkeeper, Hubert Busby. And Vinicom sees it saved by the substitute. Their third penalty miss in a row. And the new man in goal for Oxford makes himself an instant hero. I'll talk about a comfortable save. I think he's there before the ball even gets there. He's already made a decision, Busby, to go to the... Vinicom's right, his left. But it's, been re it's going to be retaken. The referee has had another consultation with Russell Evans, his assistant. One can only presume that there was some encroachment. Um, well, I what a say, finale. Rob, I thought that Busby set off very, very early, and he was more or less in the position when the ball was knocked. And I, I think... That's what the referee has seen and his assistant. Well, Busby's got to become a hero a second time over here. And will Vinicom take it? Brown, who's missed the previous two before tonight, is holding the ball. Well, will 
Busby gets right again. Brown's two misses previously were put to the right of the goalkeeper. Now, is he going to go the same side here against Busby? Straight down the middle! Surely the goal now that clinches it. Look at him, he's distraught, Busby, he really is. Maybe he wasn't running across his line, he was slightly off it, but this one, no messing from Steve Brown. He knows that Busby's going to make a decision to go either side, so it's power straight down the middle, and it's game over. Well, we've lost Steve Jones because he limped out with a bad injury at Brentford, and he's now gone back to Bristol, and you've replaced him with Andy Rammel. Yeah, we've brought in Andy Rammel. Um, it was unfortunate to lose Steve. I thought he did a good job while he was here with that himself scoring any goals and as he as he'll for we gave him one against QPR in the in the, um, the pre season friendly which I think everybody saw was an own goal. So you know in the ten or eleven games he actually did play for the club he didn't score a goal. But it's unfortunate to lose him. His presence up front um, created things for other people. Um, he won a pe couple of penalties. I think he won one penalty here against um, Luton was it our first game that he played. Um, so he did well he did well for us and now we've replaced him with Andy Rammel. But you know, although we bought Andy, with all due respect to him, he isn't Sean Devine, and, and his role isn't to, or I'd like him to score 20 goals, but um, that poacher's role is Sean's. His is to lead the front line, and I think he's done tremendously well in the time he's here. I'm sure he will score goals. Um, he, he, his record is, is of scoring goals at this level, but um, he won't, um, you know, in the best will in the world, I don't think he'll outscore Sean's total of last year. To the last 10 minutes of the opening half. Drops for Foster, and a combination of bodies able to block the first cross, but Foster clears up and gives Bristol Rovers the lead. Back for Simpson, Simpson nicely into the feet of Bullman, Brown with a layoff. Running through the middle is Andy Ramley, he's onside this time, but again Colkin is quickly off his line, and he's caught uh, the goalkeeper, and uh, Colkin is flat out on the field. And that looks... Like a nasty injury, Colkin hit the floor as Ramble followed through. And both physios on the field. Ramble is going to be booked for his trouble. He's going to be sent off, Andy Ramble. Well, what a way to make your debut. I think he had every right to challenge for the ball. The referees deemed it a foul. And Wickham are down to 10 men. But, uh, more concern is the injury to Nick Colkin. Max Warren comes in front. Chance possibly on his right foot from McSmore and a good save from Parkin. Diving down to his right. Almost looked as though the ball had got away from him. Well, Andy, welcome to Wickham Wanderers. It's a lively start you've had. Yes, uh, yeah, it's been good fun and it's just nice to be part of the team again, really. Yeah, the incident involving the goalkeeper against Bristol Rovers was particularly unfortunate. Yeah, uh, I think I've just gone to hurdle the keeper and I've caught him with my back leg, my trailing leg. But uh, I think the referee sent me off because of the lad being knocked out more so than the challenge. Wickham lost their unbeaten away record at Rotherham. The Millers had Guy Branston's close-range header to thank for their first home win. Rotherham had David Artel sent off late on, but it stayed 1-0. We're just about to speak here today on the back of a second defeat, but that doesn't really put the whole picture into perspective of how well the team has started this season. Yes, um, I say a week is a long time in politics, it's certainly a long time in football. Um, ten days ago, on the Friday night, we were second after playing Oxford. Um, seven days, eight days later, when we come in on the Monday morning, uh, we're now ninth in the table, having lost two games in a week. But that said, um, I think anybody who saw the Oxford game will, will see that we played very well with ten men for, for half that game and, and should have got something from it. And the second half performance against Rotherham, although we weren't very good in the first half, was, was, I thought was good. 
problem we've got at the moment is we just can't open teams up. We can't put the ball in the back of the net, and that that is um, what football's all about. At the end of the day, we can't do that. Seven goals in eight game, league games uh, says it all, really, um, and three of those are penalties. So only four in free play is is the reason that we haven't you know done better than you know the start we've had. Yeah, and also the fact that uh, uh, twelve points though uh, it does show how well we've done defensively. Yes, I mean the strength of the side has been we, we've been good defensively, but the strength of last year was our defensive record. Um, I said at the beginning of the season we needed to score more goals. Unfortunately, having lost Sean, uh, you know, 23 goals in the league last year, um, almost a, a third of the goals, total goals are scored. That's a big wrench. Um, I'm sure if he'd been playing by now, he'd have had four or five goals. We'd have had for, you know four, five, six more points, and we'd be top of the table. But the fact is, we haven't got in. We've got to get on with it. We've got to be strong defensively. But the rest of the team needs to start contributing goals in free play. As I say, we've only scored four goals in free play, which isn't enough, really. We're looking forward to the game against uh, Peterborough United, themselves promoted last season. And uh, any of Barry Fry's teams always pose a bit of a problem. Yeah, and they've got an old Wimbledon boy playing for him, Andy Clark, who, who's their main threat up front. And I see Barry says in the paper himself his problem is putting the ball in the back of the net as well. They rely too much on Andy Clark for that if, if he doesn't score. and Hopefully he won't against us and they don't score. Um, they got, did well last year, got promoted. Barry's a, 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 a bigger than life character, as we all know. Um, you know, he's he's brought on some good kids through that through at Peterborough, um, and they've had a very good win against Reading last week. I think it was a last minute penalty um, for handball. So they'll come here on a high. Um, they'll be thinking they only need to get a point away from home, and it'll be very difficult for us. But we have got to learn to break teams down. Um, as I say, in all the games we've played so far, I think we've been the better team over the 90 minutes. But what we haven't come off the park with is the, is the amount of points that we should have done. Um, and this will be a good test for us. Fullman turns Turn himself into a corner. Ask Rogers to plant one in. Ramel jumps, but beaten to it. Brown possibly felt he was tripped. And gets a decision from referee Brownwood. This may well be the last chance of the first half, and a dangerous one it is too for the Blues. It's two or three yards outside the penalty area. Slightly left of centre, which will favour the right foot, possibly of Jamie Bates. And he's already seen Simpson hit the ball with one effort, so Bates may use his seniority to strike it. Goal with Bates, it's a lovely way to finish the half. A cleaner strike you will not see this afternoon. Jamie Bates with a perfect free kick. Mark Tyner in the Peterborough goal, unable to move. The referee's blown the whistle for half time and perfect end to the half. It's Wickham Wanderers one, Peterborough nil. Wickham Wanderers duo Jamie Bates and Jermaine McSporran have played themselves into the Guinness Book of Records for two fantastic goals against Peterborough United. The two players scored two goals with an incredible nine seconds and remarkably, this was achieved without a single touch of the ball by a Peterborough player. Bates who touched the ball for Wickham at the end of the first half. And McSporran, who went straight from the kickoff to plant the ball into the back of the Borough net. Wickham stay among the front runners and in the process pile the pressure on Brian Horton. Andy Rammel might have missed this match, suspended for a red card at Bristol Rovers, but the FA overturned the decision and Port Vale paid the price. We're looking for Stallard to make the run into the corner. Jamie Bates in there behind him. Stallard gets to the ball. Gets to run into the area. Not to be careful here, and Stallard has found the net. Oh, soft goal for Wickham to concede. Simpson far post is Andy Ramble with the header. Trying to knock it back, Goldwoods. Chance for Baird, it's dropping in. The equaliser from Andy Baird. Only two minutes after going a goal back. The initial clearance came from Dyer. The ball dropped and Baird was there to scramble it home. First chance for Jermaine McSporran in the opposition half. Looking to take on Pierce. As far as running first time, bounces up awkwardly. Baird gets in well for Wickham. And then in with a strong challenge, it'll break for Townsend to help it up into the air. Rammel again looking to get on the end of it. Andy Rammel stabs it goalwards. It's a goal for Andy Rammel. Well, an absolute gift 
Bramwell, I don't think, can quite believe how the ball's managed to get into the back of the net. We can have a man down, it appears that Andy Baird is injured himself in that challenge. But when Townsend's high ball came into the box, it dropped for Rammel. Somehow he managed to just to stick out a lead and roll it under Lindley. And the player on the line almost watched it roll past him and into the back of the net. And from a goal down, Wickham have come back to lead 2-1 within seven minutes. The third goal would really seal things. Sender coming short. Paul Stallard out from the punch area. Simpson comes round, stabs it into the edge of the area. Brown is there, it's going to be a simple tap-in for Paul McCarthy. That should have sealed it. 3-1 to the Blues. There's ten minutes to go. And that should be all three points. As the pace setters falter, Reading took another stride towards the top. The arrival of near neighbours Wickham brought the best second division crowd of the season so far. More than 15,000 at the Medeski, the majority delighted when Martin Butler swept the Royals in front. It was a ferocious battle, Wickham unhappy with the ref long before he sent off Steve Brown even complaining that he gave Reading choice of ends and the kickoff. But they really had no one else to blame for the goal that sealed it. Of all the defenders in the box, one in blue and white was sharpest. Centre half AD Vivash netting for the first time this season. Sometimes you've got to accept a point, you know. Um, it, was, it was a fair reflection of the game, you know. If we'd have got a point at Oldham, you know, um, or a point against Bristol City and Bristol Rovers, all of a sudden, you know, two or three extra points and, and we're two or three places higher. Sometimes you have to accept a point. I remember playing Blackpool at home, you know, with three games left to go and we drew and, and people were disappointed with it. And, and Gibbo said to me at the time, you know, sometimes you've got to accept a point. And that point, to be fair, was the one that made us avoid relegation because we then went on to win the next two games and, and we avoided it by one point. This afternoon we face league leaders Walsall in what should be a very interesting game. Yes, um, Ray Graham's done exceptionally well with their team. I mean, got them promoted two years ago, just got um, failed to keep them up in the first division and, and rebuilt his team a little bit, spent some money on forward, Brett Angel and the lad from Portugal, I think it is, for some money. Um, and they're top of the table and it'll be a really tough clash. Yeah, but this is the kind of thing we seem to have relished this season, meeting sides like this. In, uh, they were disappointing last week losing at Reading, but nonetheless we performed pretty well in that game too. Yeah, the good thing is, is this season that in the top of the table clashes, we're up there as well. You know, before we were playing top of the table teams, now they're called top of the table clashes because we're, we're in the mix up as well, which shows a good improvement we've made. Um, and this will be a really tough task this afternoon. Obviously, we've got Andy Rammel, which is the connection between Walsall. I mean, um, the fact that they're able to let him go because he was third or fourth choice striker um, shows how strong they feel they are up front. And easily yeah. passed a couple of challenges. He's taking uh, Roper on, and uh, Roper fairly cynically drags him to the ground. Simpson with the kick. He's lined up across the penalty spot. Simpson's kick is... It's in! Wow, oh, quite amazing! I think Walker felt that it was going to uh, curl out and over his crossbar. And by some complete fluke, it's going on off the far post. And you have to say, completely out of nothing, Wickham have a one-goal lead. Taylor's clearance, once again asking Rammel to jump. To Roper is there once more with a header. Matthias beats Rogers to the ball and takes off down the left-hand side. Bates comes across. Matthias has got Rack in acres of space and a fine finish from Darren Rack. All alone on the right-hand side. Look him now again, able to break. Urged on by the crowd as Simpson... Crosses the halfway line, has McSporran in a bit of space, and McSporran may fancy his chances against Aaron Alden. Tilson, sent across, Rammel with a goal! Oh, he enjoyed that one against his former club. Never was there more a sweeter strike. It's the first corner of the match, though, and Simpson goes across. He's got Rammel and Bates, Ryan now, and McCarthy as well, making... Pace towards the ball, both Rammel's there again with his second. It's 3-1 to the Blues. Rammel's on a hat-trick against his former team. And what a turnaround in this second half. Wickham have come out with all guns blazing. 
But a good kick by Dean, deep into the Wick Wickham half. Flicked on Michael and chance now for Joe. Oh, unlucky! And it'll be Steve Brown, longest serving player of Wickham. Played over 200 games and that uh, chance here, flicked in, headed away not convincingly. And in the end, it's headed out by Paul Barrett. Lee Peacock fell making a run and uh, brought down in the box and a penalty in the first minute for a foul by Jamie Bates on Mickey Bell. Not the start that Laurie Sanchez would have wanted. It's given Tony Thorpe the opportunity of giving Bristol City the perfect start. Thorpe currently City's top scorer against Martin Taylor. And with the little fake step, Taylor gulling an effort to get down to his right-hand side, but to no avail. And this may well be the Blues' last chance for an attack as they pile men forward for Cousins to loft this free kick towards the penalty area. Jumping is McCarthy, gets his head to it, rambles there as go for Wickham. It's slid it off our post! Perfect time to equalise. And he rambled the man again with a header. Bates now has given it away to Holbert. Looks to steer across into the feet of Thorpe. And Thorpe squeezed it in at the far post, despite the best efforts of Martin Taylor. Caretaker boss Andy King said he's desperate for the job full time after his strugglers held Wickham. Wanderers ahead early, thanks to Andy Ramble's seventh and best this term. And despite being without eight first-teamers, they looked to have the points in the bag when Swindon lost their Dutch goalkeeper just after the hour mark. Bart Greenmink got his bearings all wrong. Referee David Pugh exacted the ultimate punishment. It didn't stop the Robins finding an injury time leveller. Giuliano Grazioli denied by the woodwork, but Alan Reeves threw himself at the rebound, and it left two managers with differing emotions. To lose 2.3, that is disappointing. Um... But uh, you know that, that's football. I mean, sometimes with ten men, it does it does invigorate a team that's lost the man and they get everything out. You know, they got nothing to lose, and they did that for the last 20 minutes and had a go. The team has come back against a very strong side with ten men and battled and should have won the game and come back and got a late equaliser. And I'm very very proud of them. They've done very very well. For the next three games coming up, we've got Bury, uh, Colchester away, Bournemouth here at home. Those three league games in particular, particular, could be quite crucial. If you go back to the Bristol City game, we always said that from the Bristol City game, um, Swindon, and then the three you mentioned, that those five games would determine our season. You know, if we'd have picked up the five points from the Bristol City and uh, Swindon again, the five points we've dropped, we'd be third in the table at the moment, you know, three points behind the leaders. Um, we haven't, and we've slipped our way down to eighth, but we're still 26 points. We're, we're, we're eight points behind the top team, so there's plenty of football we left in, you know, left in season. There's 29 games left to go. One season doesn't make, one goal game doesn't make or break a season. But as you say, it's an important part of the season. And it's unfortunate that we've, we've hit injuries and suspensions just as, as um, we're coming into it. Once more, asks Ramel to strain his neck muscles. Felt he was pushed in the back. And the referee decides, I'm going to listen to you. And awards a free kick in a very interesting position for the Blues. Fairly central, just... Four or five yards outside of the D. And Simpson and Lee once more over it, but I'm sure that Jamie Bates may fancy his chances. He of the pile driver free kicks. Maybe Kenny lines his wall up five minutes in it. It is going to be Jamie Bates. And a fine effort. Two and a goal! Bates is the man from the free kicks. Kenny B by power and pace more than anything else. The wall did absolutely nothing. Bates with a firmly struck shot, arrowed into the bottom corner. And quarter of an hour into the second half, Wickham have the lead. And the referee's awarded a penalty. 
Oh, quite an unbelievable decision, really. He hadn't ordered anything until the ball was well out of play. Then decided to go and have a look on the floor. The linesman's not giving him any hand whatsoever. The Wickham players appealing to the linesman on this near side for some guidance. The referee's certainly not going to change his mind. And certainly thought that Beaton had played the ball. But uh, out of nothing, Perry have a chance to equalise and would be another sucker punch after last week's last minute equaliser against Swindon. And it will be Paul Reed with a kick against Martin Taylor. I'm just making sure everybody's out of the area. Uh, Reed. And smashes the ball home. Berry have the equaliser. To Carroll with a fine pass to pick out Rammel. And Rammel knew exactly what he was doing, knocking it down for the on-rushing Simpson. And prepares to take his corner kick. Floats it in. Bates jumps and there's the winner! Surely the winner! Bates with a second goal of the game. You have to say possibly justice for Wickham. And a firm header from Jamie Bates. Gives Wickham a 2-1 advantage as we're approaching stoppage time in this game. Colchester against Wickham, no goals but plenty of incidents. Wickham keeper Martin Taylor was the busiest player on the pitch. Three times he saved his side. Colchester finished with 10 men after just about all 22 were involved in a touchline bust-up. Tony Locke had only been on for eight minutes. He was sent off for that challenge. The tussle followed. The rest of the players eventually calmed down. Well, Sam, welcome to Wickham Wanderers. Thanks. Uh, you made your debut at Colchester, and those of us that saw that thought you did well. Um, yeah, it was nice to get um, you know the half an hour in the end. Um, having started on the bench, it was just good to get on and you know get to know the players before I actually start a game. What do you think about the penalty incident? We were all jumping up, claiming for it, but the um, referee was quite close and gave a corner. I think it was a penalty. I mean, he, he touched me after I went round him, but to be honest, I should have scored maybe earlier. You know, if I'd have hit it early, um, I should have maybe scored. But having taken a touch, he did bring me down, so it was a penalty as far as I'm concerned. And the game at Colchester last week was uh, a bit traumatic in times, wasn't it? I mean, it was a very difficult first half, then the weather changed completely in the second half, and we saw Niall Thompson and uh, also Sam Parkin. Yeah, I mean, the weather was quite instrumental in the first half. We played into a gale force uh, win with a head headwind going behind and um, the rain, obviously. Half-time, both stopped and it was an, it, it, there was no advantage to be had. Um, I thought we did we did okay. Martin Taylor put off a couple of saves when we needed to be. We had a penalty turned down that was a definitely penalty. As you say, um, we saw the introduction of um, Sam Parkin from Chelsea. He looked quite good and, and was involved in the penalty situation, or the non-penalty situation as it turned out. Um, as I say, a draw was a fair result. It, it's, it's been an okay month. Um, won our home game, drew two away games. You have that type of form, um, you get promoted. Well, we've got Bournemouth here this afternoon, and uh, that's that's going to be another tough game. Yeah, Bournemouth are one of those t difficult teams. I think we are, our record against them isn't particularly good. I don't think we've won at um, Dean Court. Have we either won once in, in the time in the league? I certainly haven't won there. Um, and they, they're one of those smaller teams that always do quite well. They pass the ball quite well. They change the manager. Sean O'Driscoll is now in charge. We've got a couple of lads on loan. Um, Defoe from West Ham. He scored a few goals and will, um, will be um, difficult to play against. Obviously, they've got um, Fletcher up front, who, who's one of the best big front men in this division. So. It's a game we have to look to win, but at the same time, it, it won't be quite as easy as um, you know. If you look at the league table, you sometimes assume they're going to be. To cause problems, plays it out for Jorgensen. First time cross over the head of everybody, and Fletcher is there with the first goal. All alone in the six-yard box, Puts it forward and Defoe with a chance now to run again at the Blues' defence. Cousins is the man ahead of him. Defoe going infield and bangs a shot into the back of the Wickham goal. Fine finish from the youngster from West Ham. Wickham are two goals down. 
still be three minutes to go and Hatry in the edge of the box is going to fall for Carl Fletcher possibly for his second cuts inside the first challenge fires it into the roof of the net that seals it despite there being three minutes of added time Wigan have picked up 27 of their 42 points at the JJB Stadium and it was head due win as Andy Little flicked on Carl Bradshaw's cross and Simon Howarth marked his return from injury in the Grand Manor. That goal came from a throw-in and so did the second. This time it was for Wickham as Arian Dezeo showed he needs to work on his trapping technique. Sam Parkin showed how to take advantage. Wigan's ninth home win in ten attempts was clinched from another Bradshaw cross Neil Roberts in step, doing the rest. Yeah, we're in this situation now with a bit of good and a bit of bad because David Carroll and, and Andy Baird are coming back after a lengthy spell out and then all of a sudden, on Saturday, we saw Jermaine McSporran and Jamie Bates go out the side. Yeah, um, we're a bit, bit worried about the injury to Jermaine. He, he did um, his knee and it looks reasonably serious. Um, we'll know more about it um, later on in the week. Um, Jamie Bates pulled a hamstring. I mean, you know, he's a big lad and he stretched for a ball and his hamstring went every three or four weeks. I mean, it won't be a long-term injury, but obviously over the Christmas period, it's disappointing to lose someone like Bates who scored six goals and is a strength, a force that people look look at in the team. But Cuz has come in, and every time Cuz has come in, he's done a tremendous job for the club, um, and I have no worries about that. I'm sure him and, him and um, Macca will carry on with Batesy and Macca left off. Yeah. Tragedy struck once again for the team when Jockey McSporran received a nasty knee injury at Wigan. After a scan, it was confirmed Jermaine had torn his cruciate ligament and will be out for the rest of the season. Well, Martin, it's uh, been a cracking start of the season for you and it's continued right the way through to Christmas. Uh, well, yeah. Um, obviously, early part of the season, um, you know, we was uh, not really doing much, to be honest. The defence was doing really well. And then sort of the last seven, six, seven games, it's sort of been... Not just down to me, but um, there's been more chances for the opposition, and fortunately, I'm in quite good form. Yeah, and I think what really comes through about all this is the fact that the defence is playing well. But the games, and we've had a few games where suddenly uh, the defence have been under a lot of pressure. Players have got through one-on-ones, and you made some really outstanding saves. When all of a sudden you've been watching the game and been called upon. Yeah, well, that you know that is um, part and parcel of uh, football. Really, it's. You know, you separate your good goalies, I suppose, from, you know, it's, I remember Neville Southall uh, in the 80s. Uh, I can't remember the game, I think it was Ipswich, and uh, it was 0-0. He hadn't touched the ball, basically, all the game, and he made it, you know, a world-class save in the last minute of the game. It's all about concentration, you know, and, and obviously working with Peter Shilton, you know, it, it, it was the main thing he worked on was being constant, you know, being concentrated for the whole 90 minutes, you know. When the ball goes out of play, even you, you know, you watch where it goes. So, you know, so you're, uh, you're aware of where it is all the time. And there's no doubt that I mean, you really are enjoying life here now too, aren't you? You know, you're much more relaxed, I think, and uh, very, very confident about everything you're doing. Uh, well, yes, and I mean, I mean, the paper said this to me as well. But you know, I've been, I thought I've done all right since I've been there. You know, it's not nothing different, not doing anything different. You know, and obviously, um, we're a better team now. So obviously. Um, because we are a better team, confidence is better because you know, we're not losing so often or you know, where we was losing, we're drawing. And um, you know, we've just got to change them draws into wins now and then we'll be not very far away at all. So that is the difference. It's not something I'm doing different. It's just the fact that there is a lot more confidence around the, around the ground. Yeah, it was unfortunate last Saturday at Wigan. Again, another good performance and a goal that was extraordinary, wasn't it? I mean, he's lumped in from the right-hand side, and Roberts clearly has tried to return it into the centre, and it's come off his boot and flown over the top of him. Yeah, I mean, that's just, just in the, sort of the last four or five games, that's the way it's gone for us, you know. Um, uh, you know, if that was, you know, was attacking, that would have gone over the bar or, you know, in row Z, basically. That is, you know, we are having trouble scoring, you know, at the minute, and if we... You know, if we had Sean, obviously Andy's coming and he's he's doing the job that the manager wants, who's, which is releasing the pressure from the back. You know, it goes up there and it stays up there where before, you know, it used to come back. But if we had Sean, you know, then uh, I've no doubt we would be top of the league. 
for Swansea this afternoon. And really, again, we, we should win this one, shouldn't we? We should do. Um, but as I've said before, that's why nobody wins the fixed odds, because you can't guarantee results. Um, I looked at some of the results on Saturday, um, and you know QPR beating Nottingham Forest, and then Preston get done 4-0 at Gillingham. That's, the, that's why we all come to football matches to watch. If you came and knew you were going to win every week like Man United, it must be a bit boring after a while. Um, you come to hope your team wins. Hopefully they do win, but you come to see a good game of football and plenty of incident. And you certainly see that. You've seen that here this season. Um, you see that when you come and see us on the road. There's always plenty of incident. If, if it's not me, it's the players. And, um, you know, as I say, yes, we should win today. But as I say, um, the fixed odds are never won. So you always, you always beware. And then good play by Simpson. Releases Minikou. Ramble wants one across the six-yard box. Bound across the edge box. Thompson to side for home. It's there. Carroll again on the left hand side chips it in asking Borman to chase and Borman gets there first back for Carroll first time crossing Watch for Rammel again oh they put it. it's a second goal for Andy Rammel two in the space of five minutes and the pressure really telling on Swansea City as it comes through to Savarese and Stuart Roberts running through the middle and he slots it inside the far post and Swansea do have a goal back. Cambridge United's sorry run of 12 games without a win came to an end. Nothing too impressive about the goal but maybe Cambridge would do a bit of luck. Tom Young's claiming his ninth league goal of the season. Northampton and Wickham started this one neck and neck in the table and they kept in touch with each other throughout, although Wickham went in front twice. Steve Brown's seventh minute goal was a fine strike against his former club. But Northampton's top scorer Jamie Forrester found the net for the 17th time to level the scores at half-time. Wanderers regained the lead early in the second half. Danny Bullman hoped he'd bag the winner. But the Cobblers came back again with just five minutes to go. It was a seesaw match and Steve Howard had the last word with his head. It finished 2-2 at Sixfields. Luton manager Lil Fushilla hasn't had too much to smile about since taking over from Ricky Hill. Wickham boss Laurie Sanchez was also rather subdued at Canalworth Road on Friday. Here's Trevor Harris. That's well won by Adrian Whitbread. Solid challenge. Swanson going up. What with the shot? Off the post and in! It came back off the goalkeeper. I'm sure Adam Hook wants to claim it. But Martin Taylor inadvertently has given Luton the lead off the inside of the post and hit the keeper who could do nothing about it and Luton Town 20 minutes in oh 1-0 up it's a corner to Wickham Wanderers there looking to strike back early in the second half no sure if you move into the box there's Rabel and there is the equaliser terrific header from Andy Rabel you have to ask though where was the marking Timed his run, but no one near it, and he thundered it in. Stuart Fraser on the line, absolutely helpless. A little Fuccillo will not enjoy watching that again, the Luton boss. And now we really do have a game on. This is Sam Parkin. Onto the right foot. Well saved by Opendale. He'll scramble. Rebel! 2 1 wicker. Two goals in 13 minutes. 12 for the season now for Rammel. And the Wanderers have turned it round. The half-time substitutions from boss Laurie Sanchez have worked the oracle here. Half stopped by Ovendale. Once again, it was very limp defending though. Fraser hindered rather than helped, and Rammel helped himself. Scrappy, but they all count. Of course, we're now embroiled in this uh, tremendous FA Cup run, as it was to turn out to be. 
And um, we were still trying to collect points in, in the league. And Brentford came up. Well, I think we were all fairly confident we might get something out of that one. Yeah, but I think the history between the two clubs is that um, they tend to be not the most spectacular of games. And there's very few goals between them. And this was another draw. I think we drew over there 1-1, one, one, did we, earlier in the season. And um, this proved to be a, 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 a scoreless draw. Thompson throw looking for Ingham Arson again. Partridge picks out a foot and then Taylor has to stab it away from the outstretched leg of a Wusu and referee Paul Durkin not too impressed with the challenge on the goalkeeper. Gorman manages to squeeze ahead of through to Vinicu. Ball played over the top and Thompson is through. First time shot possibly. Just delayed too long. A chance now for Simpson possibly to do better than his last attempt from the corner. This time a little higher. Bates jumps and gets a header and a good save from Gotskowskin. Ingemarsson squeezes it out to Dobson. He's cross looking for Ingemarsson. The Icelandic player is there with a clear header and Taylor this time is the man having to push the ball past the post. Well found. Back for Dobson. He puts the cross into the box. Taylor dies full length, punches clear. Logan turns away from Cousins and runs it. Lavin puts it through to Russell. He's trying to shepherd him away from the danger area. Played in by Musto and a free header from Richard Logan inside the six yard box. And the first goal of the game comes on 20 minutes from Cambridge United. The chance is still few and far between for the home side. Cambridge clinging on to their one goal advantage. Richard Logan after. 19 minutes of the first half. With really the only effort clearly on goal from either side. And he's the man running into the area on this occasion. Gets away from Chris Winnicombe. Squared across for Youngs. And uh, there is a second goal. And with 25 minutes gone of the second half, we can find themselves two goals down. And to be fair, haven't deserved much more than that. Yeah, and then we, we were looking at the fixtures and they came up, we're thinking, oh, Brentford at home, Oxford away. And as it turned out, Oxford were struggling at the time at the bottom of the table. And we did actually go over there and take three points. Yeah, and it was an important three points because I think it was it was the last game before we played Wimbledon in the Cup um, in the quarterfinals, or the round before the quarterfinals. And um, we got a last-minute winner by Keith Ryan and that put us into 10th position. We had a couple of games in hand on the teams above us. And we went nicely placed into the Wimbledon games. Bottom of the class, Oxford are cast adrift by that win and their own defeat. But the day started well enough against Wickham, Chris Hackett netting after just 13 minutes. Laurie Sanchez has six strikers absent on his latest roll call, but defender Mark Rogers stepped into the breach in timely fashion after meeting the ball head on. And Wickham plundered the points right at the death from another Michael Simpson corner. Neil Cutler kept Jason Cousins at bay, but was left helpless by Keith Ryan. Oxford's anguish, understandable, the clock showed ten seconds to play. And again, after the Wimbledon games were over, um, we went to Peterborough and we further decimated through, through other injuries. And I know you, you were struggling to really select a team at the time. Yeah, it, it, it was disappointing. We, we came out of the back of the Wimbledon game and we lost Andy Baird, who did his cruciate in that game. Um, we lost um, Andy Ramon, who pulled his hamstring. Ted had done his, his ankle in, on the Saturday in the, in the, in the game. And um, I think it was Sam Parkin's last game for us. And we, with, the, we, with those injuries, we had four people, I think, who were on, who if they got booked one more time would, would miss um, the... the, the um, Leicester, City, Leicester yeah. City game and it was very much a case of trying to protect the team so we put out what was really a reserve side I mean Johnny Nutter made his debut Alan Beaton played centre half and people that hadn't had games I think Matt Brady played got games in that game we went 2-0 um, up much against the run of play um, you know there was two long range shots I think Keith Ryan had one and Martin Lee had one if I remember, cor if I remember correctly and um, all of a sudden we're leading 2-0 with about 15-16 minutes gone and we can't believe it because it was the only two attacks we've had but um, they got back into it, I think, just before half time, then they 2 1. And in the second half, um, they got into the lead, th you know, 3 2. And even then, we conspired to miss a penalty after Stuart Castling was pulled down and, and Simo came up and, and the penalty was saved. 
and we lost that game. And as I say, at the end of the season, when you look back at points dropped, I mean that that was three, you know, points dropped. But it was dropped because we had to protect players for the for the cup games coming up. After all that FA Cup drama, Wickham supporters must have thought they were still in dreamland when Martin Lee put them ahead with his first ever league goal. Wickham in front after 13 minutes. A minute later, it was 2-0. Keith Ryan the scorer this time. Then it was Peterborough's turn. It took them just a further minute to reduce the deficit through Leon McKenzie. Peterborough manager Barry Fry nagged Crystal Palace to eventually sell McKenzie in the autumn, and his determination has paid off. McKenzie scored again. 2-2, two, two, two for McKenzie, and four goals before the halfway point in the first half. Peterborough then went in front through Jason Lee. Wickham were maybe feeling the effects of that cup replay, but they were awarded a penalty when Simon Ray was adjudged to a foul Stuart Castledean. Michael Simpson saw Stuart Taylor and Peterborough cling on to all three points. Brooker looking to play the one-two, gets it back, and in behind Bates. Bates giving chase, but Brooker's in on Taylor. Taylor makes a half stop, ball come back off the post. Brooker's there to follow up, and it's 1-0 to Port Vale. Despite the best efforts of Martin Taylor, Brooker on hand to poke the ball home, and Port Vale have the lead. To the half Lee with the free kick played in towards the near post, and he's actually caught the keeper out, Martin Lee, and he makes it 1 0 to Wickham. Keeper not covering his near post, and Martin Lee saw a gap bending into the near post there, and Wickham take a one goal lead going into the break. And ball played in from the right hand side. Ryan is there with the header, doesn't clear it that far, drops to the edge of the area, play back in. Taylor coming for it, doesn't make it, scramble on the uh, goal line. Wickham desperate to clear it. I goes there though to clear up. And Reading have snatched the point in injury time. It's 1 1. And a combination of Bates and Cousins putting possession. Cousins in once more with a challenge. The ball aches again, and McCarthy is there. Cook staying on his feet. And I think we're going to see a penalty. For a challenge by Ben Townsend on Andy Cook. Cook and players go to the referee to protest. Kavanaugh has a ball in his hands. And Taylor once more called into action to try and save a spot kick. Approaching the quarter of an hour mark. And an opportunity for Stoke to take the lead in tonight's match. Referee just wants players outside the box. Kavanagh will eventually be allowed to take the kick. It's Kavanagh against Taylor. It's 1-0 to the visitors. Legs header drops for Eason though. Chance for a shot on goal. And a good effort from Roy Eason though. Pretty happy that the wall is back 10 yards. It will be Jamie Bates, I'm sure, to strike one goalwards. Bates with a kick, and a good save by Christensen. Of course, we were now starting to get a backlog of games, weren't we? Because uh, they were all building up. Um, we went into a home game here against Oldham, which, uh, again, got it all back on track because we happened to collect three points on, against that Oldham. And it was an important three points. I mean, Oldham um, have always, in the, in the three seasons I've finished here now, have have always finished one place below us. I mean, apart from this season, they finished two places below us. They were go that Oldham had, had collected an awful lot, played an awful lot of games, and although their points were higher than us, they played an awful lot more games than us. It was an important game we won. Um, it was one of it was one of those games during that period that we had to win, and uh, we got a good good result there. So on a relatively overcast day, we can still held it. Nil nil at the moment. Oldham looking to get on the attack. Lee Tomlin for the ball on the halfway line. Always want to throw, has he? No. Referee Mike North. Yes, he has eventually given the throw to Wickham. Vinicum looking for someone in space. Gets it to Ryan. His layoff though is wide of the mark. And space out on the left hand side. Wickham funneling defenders back. Played across the six-yard box and Taylor's left totally on his own. And an easy tap-in from about three yards. 
And the lead to Oldham by a goal to nil. Simple tap in. And Wickham's poor marking let him down. And he steps out of his area once more. Looking to launch this clearance downfield. Aimed at Roy Essendale. Gets a good flick on. As does Keith Ryan at the space for Simpson. Simpson's there to poke it under the keeper. Lovely play from Mike Simpson. Rode the first challenge well. Just able to stick out a toe and through the legs of the keeper to equalise for Wickham. Bidikoum now wide outside on the left-hand side. Lee making a run for him. Excellent run too for Mike Martin Lee. Chips up across. Essendo misses it. Ryan doesn't. And Wickham have the lead. Two goals to one. Keith Ryan. Essendo flew at the ball. Couldn't make it. And Ryan with a simple tapping from three yards. It's 2-1 Wickham. And then we started to come into that March period where we were trying to catch up on games that had been cancelled and we got teams like Millwall coming here, uh, Reading were coming here, um, uh, Rotherham. And it was an extraordinary period, wasn't it, really? I think we ended up in March with seven home games and we were looking at it at the time of thinking, well, that's, that's good. If, we've got, if we're going for the title and or we're going for promotion or the playoffs and we've got seven games at home in March, that'd be good. Unfortunately, what we didn't um, bank on was the fact that we would have a FA Cup quarter-final game and a semi-final game, and, and therefore March was very much used to protect the team for those two games. And and because of that, um, we we didn't collect hardly any points at home during what was a crucial period. I think between the quarter-final and the semi-final, if you can, the game before, we uh, seven games, we played six out of the top six teams in those seven games, and um, our points haul. Although we got a good draw against Millwall, um, a good draw against Reading, um, we lost with about eight minutes left to go against Rotherham. We lost in the last dying seconds against Wigan. Our points total um, was very poor. And obviously we came into the Walsall game and, and, and had our biggest defeat of the season. For the very fact that we've had to drag a player off Jamie Bates at half-time and we're 1-0 down, I think we were all 2-1 down. And all of a sudden we go on and lose 5-1. Less than two weeks until Wickham's historic Cup semi-final with Liverpool and judging by this display, players' minds already firmly fixed on Villa Park. It did take Warsaw 42 minutes to break through, the first of three for Pedro Matias. Matias was a junior at Real Madrid, but says his heart is now in England, and specifically at Warsaw. So for the Bernabeu, read the best off. And Matias' second, just after the hour, effectively ended any Wickham resistance. After that, it was all exhibition stuff. Matias turning provider to tee up Paul Hall. Full marks to the Wanderers fans, though. Are you watching Liverpool? Was the chant from their end. Walsall boss Ray Graydon signed 35-year-old former Wolves striker Don Goodman last Thursday, and he was involved in the Saddler's fourth, confidently finished by George Later. Wickham welcomed back ex-Walsall striker Andy Rammel after two months out, but Martin Lee got their consolation. Sander Vestervelt has been warned. Fittingly, it was Matthias who had the final word. An opportune time to claim the first hat-trick of his career, just as the Spaniard begins talks on a new contract. The corner now from the left-hand side. Wigan packing the area. Kazoo jumps. Good header, comes back off the bar. Scramble in the six-yard box. Poked over the line for a 1-0 lead to Wigan. Brown's corner. Deep to the far post where McCarthy jumps and somehow the ball scrambles under the keeper's body for a soft goal. Wickham have equalised. Beagry. Chance to run at the Wickham defence, gets the ball on his left foot and he's beaten Taylor at the near post and I think snatched the three points. Still the lowest veg crowd so far this season, watching in resignation as Michael Simpson put last weekend's FA Cup semi-finalists ahead after only a couple of minutes. That's the way it stayed until well into the final quarter when fate and Walter Boyd took a hand. Manager John Hollins will feel that he's owed a favour by both they had a fair share of bad luck and a fair share of bad boy during the season. Sometimes you need something to, to, to break it up. Uh, and those good luck in the terms of, of Walter doing a little twist and a turn and a twist and a turn and magnificent the way he got in there. And then confidence growing from there. The Jamaican scored twice, Jason Price grabbing one in between. Maybe now Hollins will keep faith with his Caribbean magician and hope that he'll provide the inspiration for a Houdini escape act. 
we uh, went down to Swansea on a Tuesday night, which was a dreadful place to go at any time, really. And uh, we were on the back of a, a poor result after a terrific first half. Yeah, I mean, we, we played the Swansea game, obviously, on the back on the Tuesday after the, playing the semi-final on the, on, the, on the Sunday. And we played very well for the first half. I thought we were excellent. One of our best displays the first half. And we, we only went 1-0 up. Um, all of a sudden, second half, they had nothing to lose. They still had a chance of avoiding relegation. It was their banker, really, because they needed to win that game. And having us being tired from the emotionally and physically from the Sunday, they thought they had a good chance. In the last 15 minutes, they threw everything at us and got three, three late goals. And all of a sudden, from being well in command, um, we, can, we end up losing 3-1. And I think it pushed us down to 20th in the league at that position at, at, at that time, 19th or 20th in the league. And all of a sudden, it was all, um, you know... Uh, Doom and gloom. You know, everybody said, "Oh, what's going to happen now? What's going to happen now?" But um, you know, we played. As I say, I, I was really pleased with the first. Half. It, it, it summed up our season. We were excellent in the first half, very poor in the second half. Um, but as I say, there were mitigating circumstances, and all the way along, the mitigating circumstances have been the FA Cup this year. Falkenbridge looking to make space on his left foot. He does so in a fine effort over the top of Martin Taylor. Falkenbridge one 0 Winnicoon with the free kick, hurled in, it's beaten everybody, it's beaten the keepers well and off the far post and Chris Winnicoon has snatched a point for Wickham in the last five minutes. A big step back for Bristol City's playoff hopes at Ashton Gate and that despite taking the lead. Peter Beadle denied by the post but Scott Murray was following up. Despite their FA Cup aerobics, Wanderers came into the game just two points off the drop zone. And boss Laurie Sanchez must have been mightily relieved when Danny Sender produced a fabulous equaliser just after the hour. Sanchez would probably have settled for a point, but in stoppage time, City got careless at the back. And Guy Whittingham scored the goal that may go a long way to ensuring the chairboys' second division survival. But then we suddenly picked it all up by a visit to Bristol City on the bank holiday Monday. Uh, probably extraordinary in its way the whole season's gone for us. One place where you would have thought we may not have got something, suddenly we've nicked the game. And again played very well. I mean, it, in hindsight, the Bristol game was a very big game for us. Um, again, we were hit by injuries. Andy Ramble pulled his hamstring after about 10 minutes and had to come off and Guy win and went on. And played very well up front. And we played a, a slightly different formation. Um, Danny Sender played wide on one side and um, I think it was David Carroll played wide on the other. And Guy played excellent up front by himself, and, and we played the midfield three, um, Brownie, Danny Borman and Simo were excellent that day, and we dominated the game, we, having, again, the usual story, we dominated the game in the first half, we went 1-0 down a couple of minutes into the second half, but we showed plenty of character, battle back, got an equaliser, and I'd have been settled for a draw there, I mean, before the game, but um, in the last minute, Danny Borman's um, chased the ball down, got it, um, Guy Whitnam's bounced onto, bounced onto the, to the ball, knocked it one side of the keeper, ran around the other side and put it in, and all of a sudden, from having one point, we got three points. And we come off, I think, and um, I think everybody in the bottom five had lost that day, hadn't they? Oxford had lost, Swindon had lost, um, Bristol Rovers had lost, and it, it became a mammoth result for us. Absolutely, so much so, with Swindon at home the following Saturday, I think we were then saying, well, this is it now, beat Swindon, and it's, uh, that's it, finished. If we had beaten Swindon, I, mean, I think that would have been safety, but um, as I said to the players going to the game, the important thing was we didn't lose to Swindon. If we... If we didn't lose to Swindon, we would need four more points. If we beat Swindon, we'd only probably need another draw. But if we lost to Swindon, we'd need seven points from the remaining games, and that was a big task. So we set our stall out to get a draw, um, and it proved to be. Whitting releases himself, and firm header, which allows Mars to play the ball forward. Borman breaking there, finds it for Danny Sender on his left foot. Cousins is there, it comes right across to Rees, bounces off of Taylor, and the flag up, fortunately, for offside. Swindon fans will find their uh, celebrations cut short. But as Reeves fired his shot in, Martin Taylor couldn't deal with the bouncing ball, which did it really rear up at him off the pitch. He would back there for Swindon. An excellent effort from Steve Brown, almost catching Steve Mildenhall off his line, I think, initially. Bournemouth's remarkable run continues, but the night began with disappointment for one of their best players. Richard Hughes missed his fourth spot kick of the season and has now agreed to stand down as the team's penalty taker. 
Fortunately for the Cherries, it didn't prove too costly. 20 minutes into the second half, Wade Elliott's perfect chip allowed Warren Feeney to beat the offside trap and break the deadlock. It's his fourth goal since joining Bournemouth on loan from Premiership Leeds. Another young star, Wade Elliott, added the icing 20 minutes from time, taking advantage of a poor back pass to complete a 2-0 scoreline and give Bournemouth an excellent chance of making the playoffs. Ball breaks through, Pierce chasing back. Carroll's there with him. Carroll with a shot. He's pulling it under Darren Ward. Dave Carroll gives Wickham the lead and in the same instance notches his 99th goal for the club. And could that be a priceless goal for Wickham? Sender on the left-hand side, cuts in beautifully. Looks to get in across. It's half cleared. Bullman on the edge of the area, fires in the shot. Ward pushes out. Whittingham can't get there. Bullman at the second attempt. And that should seal all three points for the Blues. We're suddenly going on the road where we're going to Bournemouth on the Monday, we're going to Notts County on the Wednesday, and then we're going to Bury on the Saturday. I mean, it's really formidable. Yeah, coming out of the semi-final, we're in a situation that um, we had seven games left, I think it was, and of those six were, sorry, nine games left, and of those six were away and three were at home. And they were tough games away, and if the results had gone poorly, and our home form hasn't been the best, I mean, I, I think in those three home games we, we picked up three draws, didn't we? You know, we had to win away, um, and that's a difficult task to ask a team when they're fighting relegation to win away. It's similar, to be fair, to the, the situation we took over here two years ago. We had to hadn't won an away game, then we won six in, in the running. So we went down to Bournemouth, um, buoyed up by the result against Swindon, and <laughs> performed abysmally. I thought, um, and I, for some reason, Bournemouth bring out the worst in us, and um, they comfortably won two 0 Could have been more, and I wasn't obviously very happy and all of a sudden you, you start thinking you know where are you going to pick up points from we got to Notts County on the Wednesday um, travel up get out five minutes play and the game's called off because of the rain and it's monsoon conditions and and you think well what are we going to do now we're going to play four games in the course of the last week of the season and we didn't want that so we went into the dressing room and I spoke to jockey Scott and I said look I need to play this game can we play it tomorrow night and everybody was very you know, very good about it and they said yeah if you want to come up tomorrow night play it tomorrow night so we did. We came back on the Thursday night. Um, wasn't a spectacular game, but um, David Carroll back in the team showed his intelligence by by half tackling, shooting um, one of their players into the goal, and then um, one nil up, and we defended with our lives to hit the crossbar. And then in the last minutes, Danny Bullman's stuck in one to win two 0 And that, again, that was a massive result. In hindsight, it was it was a you know if we hadn't got the win there um, going into the Bristol Rovers game on the, the following Tuesday would have been very very difficult but we got the win and all of a sudden we needed one point to be safe and um, we went to Bury. we stayed up as I remember we travelled we seemed to be on the road all that week didn't we? we went down to Bournemouth on the Monday had Tuesday off we travelled on the Wednesday the game was called off then we travelled on the Thursday played the game 1-2-0 we travelled across to Bury after the game um, trained on the Friday and uh, we went to Bury and on a sandpit of a pitch it was a terrible pitch and we defended again. I mean, they had the better of the game. We defended with our lives. Martin pulled off a couple of great saves, and uh, you know, all look, they scored and went in the lead from a corner, which was poor defending. But um, David Carroll's popped up with a, another goal. You know, two goals in three days, and with the draw, um, all things being equal, that was pretty much it. I mean, we weren't mathematically safe, but we'd have had to lose our last two games by three or four goals, and. Swindon would have to win their two games or Cambridge would have to win their two games. So we thought, you know, that's pretty much it, but it had to be mathematically certain. A dream start for Berry's Michael Nelson, recruited from Unibond League side Bishop Auckland and marking his debut with a terrific goal. Wickham, whose season has gone a bit flat since they lost in the FA Cup semi-final to Liverpool, equalised with another milestone goal. Dave Carroll's 50th for Wickham. It was as impressive as Nelson's opening effort for Berry. I went to see um, Bristol Rovers on the Monday night play Port Vale and <laughs> they dominated the game and lost 3-0. How, how they lost, I don't know, and they don't know, I'm sure. But what it meant was by the Monday night, I was driving back in the car and um, suddenly realised we were safe, um, you know, that they couldn't catch us. And so we went down there on the Wednesday, nice and relaxed, and promptly won 2-1, you know. Again, they had a lot of the play, but um, we took our chances when we had them. A great goal from Danny Bullman. Um, and from Danny Sender, to be fair, two long-range shots, something we haven't done a lot of this year. They scored one with about 10 minutes to go to make it interesting, but we held on, um, rode our luck a little bit, and um, 
where we were mathematically safe. Oh, go on, drive him across. It's good defending. It's there. It's there! Wickham have scored! It's flewing off his back. Sender. Marsh. Thompson away. It's there. It's all over! It's the second! 2 0 with 12 to go. Wilson, Ellington, Waters. And has the ball. Choice to drop. Yes! That's one of the back! We then put ourselves into a situation in that week, virtually, whereby that if we'd won the last game against Colchester, we could finish with the level amount of points and be in exactly the same position that we were last season. It was nice. I mean, in hindsight, you know, to, to go into that last game knowing that if we'd won, we'd have finished with exactly the same number of um, points, having had the season we've had with the FA Cup, um, that's taken a, taken a lot out of the players, and also without people like Kim McSporran missing, Baird missing, um, Devine obviously missing all season, Emblem missing all season, David Carroll and Rhino not starting the first half of the season. With all those injury problems we had, for us to to be able to accumulate the same points as we did last year was, would have been a phenomenal result. As it happens, I, I, it was symptomatic of our season. We couldn't score goals, and but for a free kick um, from Vinny and Rhino getting his head on it, it got us the one point. Basically, had one a free kick in the last minute. The goalkeeper pulled off a great save from, but a draw was a fair result. And we went up a place, went up to 13th, which was one below last year, two points less than last year, but we scored something like 10 goals less than last year, and that is the main problem of this season, you know, not being able to score enough goals in the league, and it's something we need to resolve for next year. Mm. I think looking over overall, though, I think the most important thing is when we've had the odd sloppy result as we've had, when it's needed to be important, the team will always come up with the, with the goods. We're, for, for whatever reason, we're a big game team. Whenever the chips have been down, we've had to win a game or had to dig a result out or had to have a performance, we've done it. Um, you know, in all my time here, you know, Lincoln was a classic one. In, in fact, Lincoln was one that, that we had to do, but probably the most important one was the Wednesday night when we had to play or the Tuesday night when we played Wigan that, that before the, you know, when we had to win that to give ourselves a chance in the last game, we put turn in a great performance. Lincoln obviously goes without saying, but Man City away that season. This year when we've had to dig out big results, you know, we've dug them out at, um, to say Bristol City at Notts County, at Bury at Bristol Rovers, and you know in the cup games. I mean every cup game, you know we've won most of those away from home. You know Millwall, well we didn't win it away from home, but Millwall was a, a great away result. You know Wimbledon beating them at their place, Grimsby beating them at their place, Leicester beating them at their place, and obviously the semi-final. You know we dug out a massive performance, although we lost the game. So I never worry about big games. What I worry about, and it's been a symptomatic again of, of, of my time here, is the games we should win. Uh, the games, the teams we should put away, we don't, and um, it's something we need to resolve. But the big games when, we, when the chips are down and we need to perform, we certainly do that. And Steve McGavin with the free kick just on the corner of the penalty area, looking to curl it to the far post. Does so, Essendon half clears, Engineer not back in. McLeish is there, all on his own, just outside the six-yard box, and a simple header for McLeish, and Colts to take a one-nil lead. Free kick from the right-hand side, curled in. Ryan's there, and Ryan just knocks the header inside the far post and equalises for the Blues. One apiece at Adams Park. And Keith Ryan celebrates getting Wickham back on level terms. And the Blues fans behind the goal are delighted as well to get back level pegging with the old enemy. It's one apiece. Lines up this free kick and curls it towards the bottom corner. Woodman with an excellent save prevents Jamie Bates from getting the lead for Wickham. Just let's turn for the moment now to the Worthington Cup and the uh, LDV Vans Trophy. The Worthington, we had two interesting games with Barnet to get off. I mean, we still um, need to reach the third round. That's something we've not done yet, so maybe you might be looking at that next season. <laughs> yeah, I mean... The, the Cups, I mean, the Worthington, you, we had a tough tie against Barnett. They beat us at their place. I think Ted got a late, late away goal that gave us a little bit of hope. They were a tough side to be fair. How they've got relegated with that team, I don't know, because 
on their day they looked a good side and that was early in the season when they were near the top of the table. And uh, good play by Bournemouth. He's got uh, McSporran ahead of him. That's where the ball goes. McSporran possibly in front of the goalkeeper. Chance for Jermaine McSporran. It's 1-0 to Wickham. It's been coming for 20 minutes. And the pace of Jermaine McSporran has unlocked the bar at defence. There's once more with a flick on, but straight to a yellow shirt. And this time Richard's able to get away from the slipping uh, Paul McCarthy. And a great effort on goal has got to be said from fully 30 yards. And runs towards the touchline, chance possibly for a cross. Pulls it all the way back. An excellent goal from Stuart Castle Ryan on the turn. And out of nothing, Wickham have got a second goal. Three minutes from the end of normal time. Danny Sender with a cross. He got away from Fraser Toms and Stuart Castle Ryan. No sign of goal, just twisted and off his right foot, planted the ball past Lee Harrison. Oh, on this occasion, couldn't do anything about the shot. Straight under his body, and Wickham have got a priceless second goal. It's 2 1 on the night, it's 3 all on aggregate. Right, with four 11 players behind the ball. Simpson directing operations, curls it in towards the area. Jumping is Simpson, it's in there, it's in the net. The goal scorer is Paul McCarthy, pushed forward from the back. Lovely curled ball from Mike Simpson, and just the nearest flick of his head from Paul McCarthy. Looped over Lee Harrison in the Barnet goal. We can have a 3 1 lead. And uh, already both seeds saying chance of uh, mistakes. And uh, there's one straight away in the opening two minutes. An own goal by Paul McCarthy. Claiming he was being held. Holdsworth's taking the kick quickly. Hughes slips it through for and love left foot. And there is Horsfield. And it's 2-0 to Birmingham. Oh, Horsfield and Bates continue to battle. And Johnson with a chance running into the penalty area. Johnson for 3-0. Nearly opening goal, really catching them on the hop. As Rammel looks to turn and get a shot. Goal, it's a great goal, Andy Rammel. That's one way to open your account. And a nice time to score as well for the Blues. Just into stoppage time. Into Andy Rammel just laid off on his thigh, and uh, Steve Brown off the outside of his left foot. Bared him with the early touch. It's 3 2. Simpson's corner comes in. Castle Ryan trying to get it under control. It comes through for Jamie Bates. It's there. 3 3. And from 3 0 down, the Blues have got it back to three apiece. Still five minutes or so to go. We're having to defend a corner. And no sooner are they back on level terms than Johnson has got a fourth. We then went to play Birmingham and we performed quite well at home. Well, I say quite well. In the first half, we weren't in the game, we were 3 0 down. Um, we came back and stormed back into the game, second half, Nixon performed second half, got back to 3 3, um, and then conceded a last minute goal for them to lead 4 3. Um, it gave us something to go into the second leg with, and it was a nip and tuck of the second leg. I thought we played very well over there. But at the end of the day, the quality of their four was told, and they, and they won one 0 you know, we, we we did well over the two games, and, and uh, you know, quite pleasing. Um, you know, the fact we've beaten Wolves the previous year and given West Brom a game as well shows that you know we can compete against first division teams, given the chance. And Simpson can find Rogers, and Rogers possibly able to advance now, being urged on by the Wickham crowd. Inside him is McSporran. Foran once more in field, finds Thompson looking to turn, Thompson's Thompson still going, left foot shot, there's the goal! Finally, five minutes from the end of the game, and Niall Thompson is pleased with that, his first goal in the first team. Set up by McSporran, Thompson doing well. Rode his luck as the ball bounced back to him off a couple of challenges and turned and on his left foot planted the ball finally past Stuart Fraser. And about three minutes from the end of the game, Wickham have got the opening goal. Well, that's nicely laid off. Half a chance perhaps. It's nicely done. Must be a chance and it is a goal. Brady to score it. Orange defence a little static there, 
and they could watch Matthew Brady walk through the plat wide of Bays, and it's 1 0, 20 minutes gone. And swung in there again. It's a header, and it's 2 0. Parkin gets it right this time. And surely now Wickham are going to be going through in this trophy. To prove fortunes can change, just look at Swindon Town. Last week, they were doom-ridden. This week, they're out of the bottom four, and who knows, could be on their way to the cup final in the LDV Vans Trophy. Don't mock it, it'll make them some money. Gary Alexander got both the goals that beat Wickham in the Southern quarter-final. They were two up inside 15 minutes. Steve Brown got one back, but it was Towns' night. Then in the LDV, we probably thought we might have a real chance in that this season because we started off with Exeter City here in the first game, but that was a tough game. Again, for a team that's struggling in their division, I mean, they played really well that night, and I think it was a um, one goal, one isn't we won one nil, and it was tough going, very tough going. But um, we got through that. Uh, we then played Lane Orient. And to be fair, we played very well over there. We, we, we had a few changes, gave a few people their heads and let them have a game. Matt Brady played very well that day, scored one of the goals. And um, we won 2-0, was it, over there? And then we come to Swindon. And we should have won. I mean, we lost 2-1 in the end. And we should have done better in that game. I thought we were the better side. But we conceded two sloppy early goals in the first 10 minutes. Got one back um, and then pounded them. We couldn't get a second one. And I was disappointed to go out. But again, in hindsight, um, you know, if we'd have had a back lot of pictures in the LDV and the FA Cup um, and the league, you know, it, it could have been um, horrendous getting through those games. And it's, it's interesting to note the team like Rovers that went down went down because they had a backlog of fixtures because their pitch wasn't up to standard. Um, so that is one thing you don't need. You don't need to be fighting. Games in hand are, are, are no good because, I mean, you don't get the points you deserve. Um, Bristol Rovers had a couple of games in hand going to the last last week of the season three at home um, they lost two of them and got relegated so it's something we must we must watch for the future that we don't fall behind our fixtures if we'd have in, been involved further in the LDV with the FA Cup run um, as I say we would have been massive problems towards the end of the season okay well finally just move on to the players that have been released because um, you've got eight players I think you've released this season that's the longest I can remember. I can never ever remember eight being released from the club before but it does give you a great opportunity now to rebuild the team to go for the target you've always had in mind since the day you came here, promotion to the first division. Yeah, it was difficult to do. Um, you know, people like Nutter as a young lad obviously felt it. You know, he doesn't, he, he, he thinks it's the end of the world. I mean, I tried to explain to him that he's got to get himself playing and he'll get a club somewhere and he's got to come back if he's good enough. You know, there's obviously Matt Brady has shown bits and pieces but hasn't been consistently performing. Um, Mo is obviously has played an awful lot of games, but again, in my two and a half years here, he missed a year in previously. I'd, I'd never thought he performed to the level that he should have done. Um, and you know, getting a new, fresh challenge for him won't do him any good. Westy, I, I told last year that he, he had a chance to get himself another club. He hasn't been able to do that, and, and I think that that was inevitable. Roy um, scored a great goal, made the club a lot of money, but I just felt that him and, and Guy as well, Guy Whittingham that when all our forwards were fit and if we bring one or two in the summer, they would be th fourth, fifth choice strikers and, and they need to be playing football. I'm sure Roy will get himself a, t a team. I'm sure Guy will get himself a team. Guy did very well for us in the short space of time he was here, but he was a, 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 a stopgap. Um, Alan Beaton obviously left early in the season, now playing for Chesham. And who else does that mean? Peter Holsgrove. And Peter Holsgrove is never really near the team. You know, he was a young kid that, that never got near the team. So it's disappointing to let players go. Um, you know, to see their faces when you have to tell them is it, hard, but um, it doesn't. It's not the end of the world. They've got to get themselves a club, and, and I'm sure get back. Obviously, the big one that um, by the time this tape goes out, people will realise is, is Jamie Bates has decided to retire. Um, he will be one that will be a massive one to replace. I mean, I think he played 50 games this season. In my in my time here, he has probably been my best signing. You know, he, cost, he didn't cost us anything. He's been a stalwart. He's been, um, you know. And this year he's added goals to his game. I mean, he's, he's scored six, seven goals this season. It was a shock that he decided he was deciding to retire, but um, he said he'd had enough of it. He, he, you know, he's been playing since he was 16, so he's been playing 
for the best part of 17 years and he just felt that his body um, was telling him it was time to pack in. Um, we wish him all the best. Um, it'll be a hard one to replace, um, but um, life goes on. Yep. Okay, Laurie. Well, it's been another very, very amazing season, really. I mean, it's never, it's not been a dull moment since you arrived, has it? Really? No. I mean, <laughs> last season, in hindsight, looks really boring, doesn't it? The <laughs> mid-table safety. You know, good, good couple of Worthington Cup performances. I mean, um, you know, it's, 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 it's been interesting for the fans. So, 63 games is a, is a hell of a, hell of a hard schedule to put on players and. People like Martin Taylor's played 63, all played all 63. Simo's played 61 as an outfield player. That's phenomenal, you know. And the only two he's missed is through suspension. People like Batesy have played 50 games. You know, Macca's up there near the 50. Andy Rammel, who thinks he hasn't played that many games this year because of his injuries, has played 40 games. Um, you know, uh, we, it's been a hard schedule on a, on a very small number of players, really. You know, as I say, with the injuries we've got here and, and behind my board, you can see there's, there's nine injured as we speak at the end of the season. Um, so. The team, the squad, have done very well under those circumstances. We've gained a little bit of war chest now with the cup run. Hopefully that will generate us a million pounds. I'm, I'm speaking to the board um, in the next couple of days about how much that is available to spend. I'm hoping that you know a good percentage they'll be able to spend and that we go to improve the team in the field. I've got here and I will have here next year. Um, they're all the players that have signed under me, so it's my squad from now on. I mean, it's taken two and a half years to get to that stage. It's taken me two and a half years for people's contracts to run out and and um, to assess players. But now all the players here are my players. I'm going to bring in some more in the summer. And the target is, and Rotherham has shown it's possible, is to get into those playoff situations or, or automatics. It'll be a very difficult season next year as we talk. We know Huddersfield are going to come down. QPR, we don't quite know what the situation is. They're a big club. If, they, if someone comes in and buys them, you know, they can be a big, strong club in this division. Tramia are a bit of an unknown quantity. But Cardiff coming up, I know we're going to spend, I was voting the they're going to spend more money and they're going to have a real go for it. Brighton are a biggish club, especially if they can, especially if they do sell Zamora and get £2 million pounds to, to refurbish their team. You know, as we've got, the playoffs aren't, aren't decided yet, but there'll be, you know, Stuck, Wigan, Reading, or Walsall, three of those are going to stay down. Add that to Bristol City. Um, it's going to be very, very hard work next season. It's probably going to be a tougher division next year than it is this year, which, um, I mean, we've got to be an awful lot better.